it's easy to read a look a book like Honor and and see what another society's blind spots are. Uh, but my deepest hope would be that you know American readers see some of themselves in the stories of these two women. Mm-hmm. Welcome to our latest book reporter talks to interview with our guest, Thridi Umregar. I read her book, The Space Between Us, in 2006, and I still remember that story. I can tell you where the book is on my bookshelf. And I've thought about scenes from it throughout the years, and it's made a big difference in my life just for having read that book all those years ago. So Honor, her 10th book came out in January, and it's a Reese's Book Club selection. And I finally got to it last month. I feel like, oh my gosh, what a slacker. And it's now out in paperback. And it's my latest book reporter bets on selection for 2022. Let me read you what our reviewer, Pamela Kramer, had to say about it. Honor is a moving account of the multifaceted layers that are in, in, that are India, both the beauty and the ugliness. It's a novel that screams book club because of its thoughtful and beautiful prose and the essential points it raises. And I know many people who have read this book with their book clubs, and they said they've just come out with such interesting discussions. So I'm so looking forward to talking to you. So with that intro, welcome, Freddie. Nice to have you here. Thank you so much. It's great to be here, Carol. So let's start out by your telling us about honor, because I know I will mess this up. So let me have you do it. (laughs) Um, So basically, honor is the story of two women from uh, both of Indian origin, but um, you know, the currents of life have taken them in very, very different directions. Um, uh, I would say the central character in the novel is Mina, uh, who is this, um, she lives, she's functionally illiterate, she's very poor, she's the daughter and sister of farmers. Um, She lives in um, this small village in isolated, um, fairly isolated village in India. And um, when the novel opens, we find out that her husband um, has has been killed by her brothers and that she is now suing the brothers, which is an incredibly heroic thing to do. And the reason for this great tragedy that she has suffered is simply because she made a decision to marry for love. And the person that she loved, Abdul, happen to be of a different religion. She's Hindu, he's Muslim. And for this act of transgression, um, she she pays you know a very heavy price. Um, the other character is Smita, who is an Indian American uh, journalist living in New York, who finds herself um, very much against her will back in India, a country that she has left when she was a teenager and has vowed never to come back to, for reasons that we don't quite know initially. Um, But Smita is sent to India to cover uh, Meena's uh, court trial, court case. Um, And the rest of the book is about, I guess, what lessons the two women have to teach one another, um, you know, they start out at polar as polar opposites and kind of meet somewhere in the middle. And a lot of the novel is is really Smita's journey. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, she starts out back in India, uh, really defensive, really not wanting to be there at all. And I think by the end of the novel, there is a kind of maturity and a kind of softness um, that that develops. And, and even a kind of perfection, or at least an appreciation that just as most countries in the world, India has its good and it has its bad. And to be an adult, I guess, is to embrace both. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, uh, That's not a very good, I'm not sure that I did a better job than you would have in summarizing <laughs> the book. But. No, you did a wonderful job because there's so many different threads that happen. And we'll get into those because the really the story is these two women, these two women. And there are two women that one has been privileged and one has not. One might have stayed, but left. And she also has said for years, I will not do any reporting in India. I will not go back. And mm-hmm. we find out the reasons for that as the story um, progresses. But at the beginning, you're just seeing this journalist showing up I heard that Ellen Berry did a number of stories in the Times that influenced your book. 
And I was actually lucky enough to listen to a conversation the two of you had earlier this year. But tell us about her work and how her work influenced you, because I find it interesting that she's an American journalist who didn't grow up in India, but her stories had that much influence on you. Yeah, she's just, she. I think she's an incredible reporter. Uh, I mean, she clearly has a knack for winning the trust and confidence of people who, frankly, she has nothing in common with. So she was posted, I think she was the South Asian bureau chief uh, for a while, uh, around 2015 or 2016, somewhere in that period. And she did a series of stories about small town India. Mm -hmm. And one of the stories in particular that, that really acted as a kind of delayed um, um, inspiration for honor uh, was a story she did about a group of very intrepid um, women living in a, growing up and living in a village in India who decided to break thousands of years of tradition and custom and seek employment outside the home. You know, something that you and I, it doesn't even, we don't even think twice about. I mean, of course, you're going to graduate from college and then what do you do with your life? You're going to get a job, you know. But for these women, um, it was like breaking all kinds of taboos and the wrath of the village, not just their immediate families, but the entire community sort of came down upon them. And I was... I was really blown away because even though I grew up in India, you know, I was born and raised in Bombay. I still call it Bombay, Mumbai today. You know, one of the biggest cities, most culturally and uh, diverse. And um, I, this was not my experience uh, growing up. Um, so the stories were really eye-opening for me. And I found myself way after I had finished reading them, periodically thinking about these women, sort of worrying about their fate, wondering where they were now, what had happened to them. And, you know, that to me is a test of a lasting story when, you know, you could be washing dishes or you could be watching a movie. And next thing you know, somehow your mind goes to something that you've read a couple of years prior. And that's indeed what happened. And then one day the character of Mina, uh, based very loosely, but based on, you know, so, uh, what these women had, had suffered and gone through, came to me. And after that, you know, the, the novel itself took over. Yeah, the story just took over from there. You know, staying on the subject of reporting, and Smeet is covering the story, she feels that Shannon's writing, American, is less biased than hers. And she was born in Bombay, moved to the U.S., and she feels she's substituting for this other female journalist who's a white American. And do you feel that those outside the country cover the world, cover this um, India differently? Because they come in seeing it with just different eyes of what's gone on. Yeah, yeah, of course they do. I mean, that would be true for most people. Um, I, I do know that even amongst my, um, you know, very upper middle class relatives and uh, friends, there has always been a kind of chip on their shoulder about how uh, Western media depicts um, uh, India. Uh, and not just in, in the case of journalism per se, but even the movies, you know, mm -hmm. so that a movie like Slumdog Millionaire, which I loved, and I mean, not only was it a great movie, you know, it moved at this amazing pace, but I, I thought it really cast a light on the slums and the poverty of India in, in ways that really impressed me. But there, there was a very negative reaction, at least amongst one part uh, of the Indian population to that movie, because their um, belief is, you know, India is this economic powerhouse. I mean, its economy is bigger than that of Britain now, mm -hmm. you know, England. Um, so why is it that any time a story is told, it's always about the poverty, you know, how backward the country is, so people are defensive about that. And, and there's a part of me that recognizes that. Um, I, I understand sort of the con colonial and the post-colonial history of the country and why people feel that, uh, that there is something to be said for this kind of slanted um, 
uh, you know, focus on, on just one aspect of what is a very large and very diverse country. Uh, I get that. And yet my core belief is if you are embarrassed by the depiction of reality, change the reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, don't blame the messenger. Uh, if the message is something that's disturbing to you, then you have to question and examine why and then work to change that. Um, so uh, in that sense, I do think that somebody stepping in from the outside and I'm assuming that this person comes in with the best of intentions. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that the person is somebody like Ellen Berry, whose only job is to do a great job, is to be honest in depicting what she sees. You know, not somebody who already comes in with a bias or with some preconceived notions. So if somebody comes in with that degree of integrity, yes, they are going to see the country in a different way than um, somebody who has spent their entire lives living there. Mm -hmm. I dare say, you know, I left India when I was 21 years old. Um, I still write about it quite a bit, but I dare say that that my uh, books would have been very different if they would have existed at all, if I had never left the country, you know? Mm -hmm. So that outsider, insider gaze is, I think, very essential in some ways to literature. Yeah, and you know, and then to go to the other side, we've got Bollywood. We have these films that are all about romance and this and that. And I do confess to having watched Bollywood Wives on Netflix. I will confess. Oh, <laughs> and I'm sorry. It was just, but you know what? There are moments where you watch something that is so over the top. I usually do it when I'm answering email because I don't really have to pay attention to this drivel. Like I'd never mm -hmm. watch a Housewives movie in the States, but this is, they're going to fabulous places. They're going to do <laughs> these things. And they're also talking about their life in film. And then they show the actual film of what's going on. And it's just very interesting because after reading this book, watching that, you realize the real dichotomy in the country of this false sense of romance that also goes on over the top romance in these films. Right. Um, yeah, I think that's a very good um, uh, observation. I honestly think India is a country that's obsessed with marriage and, yes. you know, giving birth to children. And uh, I mean, I don't know of any other nation that's more obsessed with the thought of marriage than than India is, you know. And yet, of course, making. the vast majority of the marriages are arranged marriages. So, so that's yet another twist on all of this, you know. Okay, I confess to watching Indian matchmaking too. I mean, people, you know, my bar is high, but we can also uh, go low. You know what I mean? Uh, but it's, it's yeah, so Carol. I'm beginning to worry a little bit here. <laughs> well, the other thing too is I had someone who worked with me for years ago. And he, his family was from India and his brother was getting married there. So I understood the whole wedding that was going to go on for days. And I yeah. find that we, okay, we have the one, then we're going to get back to the book of this, you know, small villages and what's going on. But then we also have these weddings that are going to go on for days with exchange of gold and all these kinds of things. So really you're looking at a country where certain people in the cities are very different than the people in the small villages. It's a very different kind of culture, unless I'm lo losing something, you know? I think I think this is true almost everywhere in the world today. I mean, look at our own country, mm -hmm. right? Look at politics. The divide anymore is between urban and rural. Mm -hmm. You look at voting patterns in the U.S. now. You can almost predict how you know individuals or at least how communities are going to vote based on geography based on location mm -hmm. um and i think that is certainly true uh for country uh, for places like like in india mm -hmm. um so you're on to something there but i should add that even amongst the poor um you know uh, weddings are so important to the fabric of the nation or at least to the life of the community that there are heartbreaking stories of farmers and you know poor people going into debt for generations wow. to borrow money, you know, because they don't really have access to banks and things like that. And banks are not going to give loans for, you know, marrying off your daughter anyway, right? Um, so they go to these village money lenders who charge ridiculous amounts. I mean, our credit card companies here uh, would be salivating uh, if they knew the 
percentage, you know, of, of what the interest rates are in places like that. And obviously these people are just one bad monsoon season away mm -hmm. from being wiped out. Mm -hmm. So there are debts that go on for generations also that you can have those four or five days of celebration, you mm. know, so that you can, I mean, the novel is called honor for a reason. You know, there are just all these twists on the meaning of the word. I mean, this is a way of, of uh, keeping your head up, keeping your head raised in the community is by throwing these lavish uh, weddings. So it's not just amongst the people in Bollywood and, and the ultra rich, uh, even poor people fall prey to all of this. So interesting. So you've got Mina who's accepting this job in a factory along with her sister, breaking tradition, breaking everything you're allowed to do. It's something that women don't typically do. How much are they still oppressed working in these villages? Is it still these days that you may not work, you are in the home, this is what the, in, in some of the more backward villages, or is it something you see in more places than I want to think about? You know, the short answer is, I couldn't give you a percentage. I don't mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. I mean, clearly, just, just going back, you know, Ellen Berry's reporting is not from the 19th century or even the 20th century. It's just from five or six years ago. So clearly, there are pockets of the country where these mm -hmm. kinds of taboos and restrictions on the movement of women, because that's ultimately what it is, mm -hmm. um, still exist. Uh, are they in the majority? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the short answer. I just don't know. Mm -hmm. um, I have not actually lived in India for almost 40 years. Mm -hmm. So I don't know the, you know, the nitty gritty of, of all of that. Um, but clearly, clearly there are places like that that do exist. And, and um, yeah, the oppression of women takes multiple mm -hmm. forms, you know, mm -hmm. um, just not allowing women to work outside the home is just one of those forms you know any society that that basically believes that women are ultimately the possession of men and and that the the value system uh, you know the family honor rests on controlling mm -hmm. the movement of women any society um that believes in that that ascribes to that value system um you know there's a problem Wow. You know, and I agree with you. I agree with you because it's like, how are women valued in any society, whether it's be pay, equal pay for equal work, equal time when you have a child, just any single thing that's happening right now, right. where are women and where have we made strides and where haven't we? And if you really laid out the payrolls, is it really still fair of what's going on? We don't really know. You know, it's well, we hear and, it. and, and this year has, has sort of shown us how quickly Mm -hmm. rights that people take for granted, how quickly they can be snatched back, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so so I, I always fear that, you know, Western readers, American readers reading my books might be tempted to, to sort of uh, feel pity uh, for the characters that they are reading about. And I think that's the wrong reaction. Uh, I, my, my greatest hope would be no matter how different the circumstances might be superficially, that they can see some of themselves and their own lives mm -hmm. in, in these characters, mm -hmm. you know, um, because it's just a difference of degrees, Carol. Mm -hmm. It's, it's nothing more than that. And, and if, if in any society, if women, I mean, look at those pictures of uh, women in Iran in the 1970s, yes. In yes. mini skirts and, you know, um, these same women, you know, in in the blink of an eye, uh, were veiled, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. things can change, and they can change really quickly. We had a woman who worked with us um, who lived in Iran and when she was growing up, and when she'd go back, she'd know when you were in the airspace as you were flying in that you needed to cover your head, and it was. Really, it was like, you know, apply your headscarf on the plane, like, and she would know exactly where that needed to happen, or you would be, you know, out of, uh, out of favor of what you were supposed to do, even though she right. was American now, she right. knew the customs, yeah. she knew the rules. Absolutely. 
absolutely uh, yeah what to do is the prejudice between hindus and muslims the same in cities and the villages as, from what you know at this point or is it yeah you know, i i i feel like everything is a little looser in the cities i mean certainly when it comes to the caste system which of course only uh involves uh hindus you know uh, muslims don't have the caste system christians don't you know all the other groups in india don't subscribe to the caste system it's a it's a hindu thing um but even that you know if you're riding in public transportation in a city going to work you don't really know the caste of the person sitting next to you just by looking at them you know but if you live or if you were born and raised in the kind of small village that say mina was where everybody knows everyone then of course you would know based on occupation based on what somebody's father's father did for a living you would know what caste they were so you would be much more aware of of caste for instance in the villages than you would in a big melting pot you know cosmopolitan city like like bombay um so and i think the same is true for religion too um i mean there is i think like in housing and i mean there are certainly neighborhoods that people would say oh this is a muslim neighborhood mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. but having said that um you know i can think of uh, thousands of neighborhoods where there would be hindus living in a building and there would be muslims and there would be parsis like me and my family and there would be christians and there would be the handful of jewish people left in india you know and it would be fine be a melting pot more you know when i grew up um we grew up we were in, went to catholic school yeah. everybody we knew was catholic we, the good thing about being catholic was um if your public school friends didn't have off the day after halloween you could stay home and eat your candy because it was all souls day we got to have off and <laughs> it was interesting because we only knew our culture to a very large degree we knew that there was a big Baptist, you know, church in you know another part of town, and they had a lot of activities for kids. We knew a few people who were Jewish, and my children now are in such a different melting pot. And I've often said that I feel like um, when kids are thirteen, they're either confirmed or they're uh, bat mitzvah. And I feel like the next year they should go learn each other's religions. And my children, for being more in a melting pot kind of a world, have been to Indian weddings. They've been to bar mitzvahs. They've been to so many different things that culturally, I, am older than they are by just a generation, never took part in. And we didn't yeah. know. We went to somebody's house one time to break fast for um, Yom Kippur. And it was a learning experience for us. We had no idea what was going on. But those experiences, my parents grew up in an Italian neighborhood. There was a um, another neighborhood that was the Irish people. And we were also segmented. And I think that we have to look at now what's going on even in this country is people are coming more together, moving different places, intermarrying, which didn't happen before. I, I completely agree. You know, this is why I don't believe in fake nostalgia. I don't believe in, you know, the good old days. I feel like these are the good old days. Mm -hmm. If we could just acknowledge that and see it. I mean, I think there's just such hope and such promise, um, uh, you know, being alive in 2022, exactly for the reasons that you just um, uh, talked about. Yeah, it's more like not right and wrong. Everything is to be right and wrong. You're right, I'm wrong. And it's not quite that when you have intermarrying and things like that. I also was thinking about the feeling about as outsiders of one of Mina's brothers says that he felt better talking to Smita than he did to Shannon. He said that other lady, the foreigner, she doesn't understand us, our values. And they're looking at her dress and they said she was respectful of them where Shannon wore pants. And it says so much about following traditions, but also so shows so much about showing up the right way to go out and have some kind of deference when you're going and speaking with people. Am I on the right planet, uh, plan, plane about talking about that, of be part of where you're going? Oh, I think so. I think it's a matter of simple respect. Like when you were talking about your friend from Iran, who, even though she's an uh, American citizen, still wears the scarf when she's when the plane's about to land you know some of that i understand might just be required mm -hmm. of even foreigners um coming to iran but some of it is just a measure of respect mm -hmm. you know you respect the local culture you're, you're not so arrogant that you think 
your way is always the right way. And and you just, you bend, you bend a little bit in acknowledgement of uh, the the paradox, though, in the in the statement that you read about, um, you know, I guess it was Gobin, you know, uh, mm-hmm. thinking of the difference between Shannon and, and Smita, is that I'm not convinced that from the inside, Shannon and Smita are all that different. Mm-mm. I mean, Smita is just faking it uh, yeah. a little better. And it's easier for her to do it because she looks more like Govin than, than Shannon does. She doesn't stick out as much. But in terms of her beliefs and her politics, and you know, she's as much of a feminist, for instance, as, as Shannon is. I mean, she's, um, I don't even want to say she's American by temperament, because that would imply that her views have only been shaped after her family leaves for America. But even if she had continued growing up, in the family that she was raised in, in Bombay, pretty modern, progressive, uh, cultured family, she would have probably had the same value system that she does. Um, so uh, it's it's Govind who wants to read something into the situation. Um, it's a bit of a sleight of hand on, on Smita's part. It's, you know, she's it- dressing the part, if you will. And he is trying to curry some favor at the same time by saying yeah, what he says. Yeah. It's a little bit going back and forth. There's a little bit yeah, of this. Exactly. Yeah. And the meeting with the brothers was actually the toughest part of the reading the book to me. They spit on the ground and they said, there is no Mina. Their sister is dead. She's dead to them. And they did want to stop her marriage. I did love this part. But one got so drunk that he missed the opportunity to do that. So that also says something about the brothers. But I found that say so much of them, but the level of hate really chilled me about the way they really hated what happened to their sister. And I take it there's precedence for acts like this, but it was to actually go and do that to your sister's husband that also maimed her is so unthinkable on so many levels, but they really feel it was right instead of wrong. Right. So the title honor, of course, is ironic to some extent. I mean, it is and it isn't. I mean, ultimately, I didn't want to call the book Dishonor. I wanted to call it Honor um, because I wanted I wanted to valorize, if you will, Mm -hmm. the people who really do act in honorable ways, even when uh, circumstances don't really make it easy for them to act as honorable people. But but, you know, uh, the brothers genuinely down to their toes, believe that they are the ones who are honorable. They are the ones who are right. They are the ones who, you know, have taken this action because they were helpless victims of their sister's treachery. And this is the only recourse. This is the only way by which they can restore the family honor, the family's good name. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, I'm writing a book right now, and um, there's a line in it that says something to the effect of nobody's the villain of his own story, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. and I think I think that's true. I think it's very seldom that people do something horrific that's objectively horrific and know that it's horrific, you know. I mean, people can always find this is one of those things about human nature that's pretty frightening, actually, you know, that people can find justifications for just about anything, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. The the brothers feel they're doing something right. It's male pride. Is it male toxicity? Is it really belief in religion? Is it belief in superiority of men over women of what they can do? But they really feel that they have honored their family, honored their village by what they've done, because they feel like their action will keep other people from doing this as well. They've honored, but you know what the the culture of their of their town by doing right. what they did, right, right. And she also worries that even if her brothers are found guilty, that there are others that will be taking out uh, consequences on her. And she talks about you know the gr- government is corrupt. This is what's going on. Is it really that corrupt? I mean, it could be corrupt here in the states too. Let's get real. But is it really that corrupt where money is exchanged for power and you know changes in uh, verdicts in India? Yeah. Again, I don't know that, I don't know what percentage of judges are, um, well, let's just stick to judges for the moment. Cops really are corrupt. You know, I I don't know what percentage of judges might be corrupt uh, in that blatant manner of 
uh, handing somebody a bribe to get a certain verdict. But um, it it does happen. Yeah. And, and most of the time, the wheels of justice in India, I mean, they just they just creak along, you know, there, there are cases in the law books in India, from what I've heard, where cases have been going on, I'm glad you're sitting down, for 200 years, wow. Wow. you know, I mean, now that's not typical, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but it, it moves, I mean, the population is so great, mm-hmm. and the caseload, you can imagine what the caseload is, mm-hmm. uh, but Things take forever, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, So in that sense, Mina is lucky in this particular novel and that her case is sort of, it's moving uh, rather quickly through the system, you know, Mm -hmm. but that's not. So so you can say, you know, that old um, saying of um, uh, justice delayed is justice denied. Um, In that sense, too, you can talk about corruption, right? Uh, It's not corruption in the classic sense of, of handing over a bribe or something like that. But if something takes 20, 30 years to get resolved, what happens to the litigants in, during that time, right? Yeah. It's like lives are on hold. Lives are on yeah, hold as decisions exactly. are made for right. something that now is this as bad as it was here. I mean, you even right. look at cases here now, things that were, you can take marijuana as an example. That was an, an arrestable offense. Now we're letting people off. It's like right. a, in a case of, 20, 30 years, something that's on somebody's record is now nothing. It's now, right. now right. Legal. something, but, but they'll never get those 20, 30 years back. That's the thing, you know? Right. Yeah. And you just sit there and looking at that, you know, and Mina's mother-in-law, um, Ami has such disdain for her when she just really woes, woes, woes this girl. And she's always talking about that. Now she's not going to have any money because Mina's not going to have any money to give to her. And Mohan, who is the person who's accompanying um, Smita on this trip, he gives her money and it's something that Mina would not be allowed to do. It's like the money can't come this way. And he does this. Something that Smita is not allowed to do. Smita is not allowed to do. It's a question of honor. Smita cannot hand that money over when they're in that situation. She could want to, she could have given it to him to do, but it's Mm -hmm. things like this. The man is in charge of doing these certain things. Um, In this particular case, it's not so much because of gender uh, differences it's just that she is a journalist. Um, I mean, she's a product of American journalism schools. And, you know, we just don't do that in this country, right? It's mm-hmm. just one of those uh, ironclad rules that that you do not pay a source for information. Mm-hmm. Um, but of course, these are, these are customs and rules that have developed over the course of, you know, at least a century. Um, based mostly on middle-class values in this country. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, that's what journalism used to be. It used to be a middle-class enterprise. One of the questions the book asks, because Smita herself is sort of tormented by this, is do those same rules apply to different countries, to people, like to sources like Mina, who are living in such dire poverty um you know does it make sense to apply the same rules to Mm -hmm. to Mm -hmm. a situation to a country that is so wildly different than ours you know um and i don't i don't answer that question for Mm -hmm. her and the book Mm -hmm. because to be honest with you i don't know the answer to that Mm -hmm. you know i can i can truly i feel like split in half i can see both sides of that argument you know but she's thrilled he takes it on. She's thrilled that he just goes and does this because it's something she cannot do. And it's yeah. like, like yeah. please let it get taken care of for me. Yeah, because Mohan is a civilian, right? He's not a journalist. So he's bewildered. I mean, to him, it seems, and he's a good guy. It just seems so obvious to him. If I can help somebody by by throwing a few hundred you know, rupees at them, of course, I'm going to do it. If I can feed them for a month by hauling, you know, a sack of rice and uh, beans to to their home, yeah, of course I'm going to do it. Right? He doesn't understand. That's one of those cultural um, misunderstandings between the two of them, where they're just going at it. And it's interesting where they go different places. Where they, you know, they check into the hotel, and she says one thing, and he says another thing. He says, "I'll bring you a beer." Like I'll get two, and. Right. 
it, it's just a very interesting moment. It's it's also I'm going to get to that in a little bit, but it, it was very very interesting that like certain things happen and then they don't. Some things mean things and then they don't. So you have to be careful. I did want to touch on Abru, which is Mina. I think I've had that pronunciation right. Mina's child's name means honor, and I really love that when I read it in the book because it just means like no matter what happened between us, we honor this child. To, to that's what I was saying as my takeaway. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. It, it was just beautiful. There are passages in a different font where Mina's sharing her feelings. And I feel like in writing, she could share what she could not speak. And the way it is there in writing, these are words I cannot say. Did those come later in the writing process or as you were going along? Did you go back and drop her thoughts in? No, it, it was fairly chronological. In mm -hmm. fact, in the I, I think this is correct. In the very first um, uh, version of the book, I think we hear from her much sooner mm -hmm. um, than we do. You know, now, if you recall, I think all of book one is just Smita's, you know, Smita lands in India in chapter one, and we don't hear from Mina almost until the time that Smita does, you know, mm -hmm. until the time that they meet. Um, but one of the things that I was very sure of from, from, I think, pretty much from the start was that I would not tell Mina's story in the third person. You know, Smita's story is told in the third person, mm -hmm. but Mina talks directly to us, um, the readers, in, in her own voice, in her own way, in, in first person narration. And I feel like, <clears throat> excuse me, it was as much of a, um, political decision that I made as it was a literary one. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that was, uh, by that is, <clears throat> excuse me. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Mina is somebody who has very little agency in her life. She, she has always been governed by someone else. Right now it's her two brothers. Um, she is basically voiceless, you know, um, when she tries to find her own way in life by taking the job outside the family and then falling in love with a Muslim co-worker and marrying him, she is brutally punished for, the, for this. Um, she is somebody who has never been able to tell her own story. Mm -hmm. And I felt that I didn't want to compound that mistake. You know, I, I wanted to hear from her. I wanted her to tell her own story for once in her own words, in her own voice. And that's why the narrative style is so different when it comes to her sections than it does to, to Smita's. Mm -hmm. when, I also noticed you had the books. Did you always know it was different, like book one, book two? Did you, When you were writing, did you craft it that way or did that also come later? I think that part, as I said, um, if I'm remembering right, in the early version, um, I think Mina's voice is introduced much sooner. Mm -hmm. So it, it was always this sort of disruption in narrative, right? So you had the third person omniscient voice that tells Smita's story, and then you would have these bursts. Mm -hmm. uh, of chapters that were suddenly, uh, and they, they sounded a little intrusive because at first you didn't even know uh, who was speaking and why. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in one of the revisions, I thought it made much more sense to introduce Mina after we had established uh, Smita and her reasons for being in India. Mm-hmm. And I just thought that as you go back and you look, because now I'm back, going back on the book, oh, that was book one, that was book two. And you yeah. actually look at what the author was crafting at that time, whereas before you're just reading it for story. And I That's think true. it's one of the pleasures of being in book group or having a discussion like this, because you analyze the book much more than just the beautiful read at the beginning. It's like, oh, now, wait, wait, what's going on here? There was some, there was a thought to that madness, you know? Yeah, like, you know, there. people understand this about books of uh, collections of poems, for instance, you know, a book of poetry, like there is a kind of order, right, in which the poet will, will um, they may have written uh, the poems at very different points. Uh, but then when it comes to organizing the book, there's a kind of method to their madness, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, but it's harder to remember that even works of fiction, like a novel, is ultimately it's a construction and it's constructed in the same way 
as a book of poems might be. Mm -hmm. Well, you think about music. Music used to be someone went in and made an album. And I'll use Paul Simon. He's, this is my favorite as a favorite um, writer, composer. And he would put the songs in a certain order of how you were to listen to them. And then you were going to flip the album. Let's go back like an ancient, ancient times, folks. You'd flip the album over and you'd have to have a good start and a good finish on that side as well. So when you were listening to something, that's the way you flow. So what are we doing today? We're buying songs and bits and bytes, and we're not on that complete flow of what's going on. The song that might come in, and we'll use the same thing as chapters. Chapter five coming in here makes sense for six, made sense for four, but now it's just a cacophony when you think about music that has really been bastardized in a lot different way than books or whatever have, no matter how many formats we've moved to. We've moved to ebook and audiobook, but we still are reading a contiguous story as opposed to like, I agree. But you know, when you were saying the thing about flipping to side B of an album, right. what struck me was it's weird. Like we, none of us have listened to albums in like what, 20, 30 years, you know, ever since CDs. Uh, and yet I can almost like bridge over troubled water uh, you know, by the time one song ends, I can I know what the next song is going to be because it's just it's like part of your DNA. You know, mm -hmm. you just know the order of the songs. You know, mm -hmm. so, but yeah, I agree with you. It's uh, playing in your then, of course, Yeah, you had the concept album, right? Like yes. like uh, Sergeant Pepper. I mean, yes. which took it to a whole different where songs actually bled into one another. You know, right. you didn't have that thirty second pause between songs so. yeah it was gonna it's just yeah. interesting because you find how much has changed and i mean we're now listening to albums again we have a turntable here my husband's constantly playing because the quality is so much better the sound is so much richer and people are remastering and it's interesting to see the number of young people going back to vinyl so well, that's uh, we, dig we digress and talk about music for a moment but we will folks are back from our commercial break. You know what I mean? <laughs> so at one thing, one time Mohan um, said, the one thing you have to understand about India is that half these customs exist just to save face. As long as you don't rub it in their faces, nobody cares. And I really love that line. And I think it was when he was getting the beers or something like that. It's right. You can have it, right. but I have to not let them think you're drinking. Yeah. It's like, it's just saving face. You know, uh, there are traditional cultures that pay, put great weight on saving face, you know, mm -hmm. uh, what will the neighbors say, you know, those kinds of things. And um, yeah, I'm not sure that he's right when he says nobody cares, but as long as you're not rubbing it in their faces, you know, you can get away with a lot. You get away with a lot. Well, which leads us to something that we're really don't want to give away too much about, but early in the books, meet her and heads to her old neighborhood. And she looks up her mother's best friend and she's surprised at how she is received. And readers are now setting up that something happened in the past to this family in India. How did you work on parsing out that story? Because we get a hint and we get a hint pretty early on, but we don't really get the story till much later. Was there a particular like, did you write it and know where you were going to go or did you hold yourself back too? I think I held myself back, although, um, you know, it's a great question because I have been known at times to write out of chronological order, but I, I don't remember uh, doing that in this case. I just felt that if I, if I, I knew, I knew what had happened to her very early on, mm -hmm. uh, but I just pulled myself back because, you know, when she finally confides in Mohan and tells her, uh, tells him about her past, it sort of, comes bursting out of her mm -hmm. the whole mm -hmm. story mm -hmm. and i wanted i wanted to write it in that same burst like i i think i wrote if i'm not mistaken i think i wrote that entire chapter in one sitting mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. i just poured out of me precisely because i had held it back for so long that by the time i came to that point it was ready to just kind of pop out Mm -hmm. um, and and I wanted you know my experience in writing it to to imitate her experience and actually telling the story mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yes, it does, and it's because you feel that you know she's not saying something you don't know something up front, 
And then when you hear it, it does like you're, you as a reader, you're like, whoa, this is really what went on. This is really what happened. And you see so much of her. It's almost like you want to go reread and say, wow, there's even more that we didn't know about her, like why she was so shielded, why she didn't want to come back. Very, very, it, it's beautifully done because I feel like um, as I was reading the book, I was surprised, shocked, and then moved into another place. And it was surprised and shocked about one thing, but then something else as well. So beautifully done. Mm-hmm. So at one point, there's a conversation about terrorism, uh, terrorism attack, and there's a conversation on who would do this. And Smita would told all kinds of people, seemingly ordinary people who rise each morning, eat breakfast, smile at their neighbors, kiss their children goodbye. People who looked and act just like you and me until they're gripped by an ideological conviction or disruption in their lives that makes them want to rearrange the world or burn everything down. And those are such very powerful lives to consider because it's not like people who are doing things are different from us. They're us with a different uh, a different ideological value at some point or something that takes hold that they cannot right. shake. And right. I, I, I pulled that passage and I was just... That is something to really, really think about is it's, it is you and me now. Well, and yet, and yet we forget that, you know, every time there's a school shooting, for instance, Mm -hmm. uh, what do we do? We always, you know, this was, he was a crazy person, you know, Mm -hmm. this was just somebody. And in a way it's good to think that way because, um, you know, these acts of mass murder for no apparent reason should remain um, strange to us. They Mm -hmm. should remain aberrations, right? Um, But on the other hand, it's so easy and it's so, um, you know, change never comes if you just write off every one of these acts as something out there done by somebody with whom we have nothing in common rather than sort of understand understand what's happening at a macro level you know what is it about the culture that keeps producing Mm -hmm. the so-called madmen you know Mm -hmm. i refuse to believe for instance that we in the u.s have more crazed people than anywhere else in the world Mm -hmm. and yet no other country has the kind of uh, gun violence that we do right and i find it downright unpatriotic to to treat this as if this is some uniquely American problem. I mean, it is an American problem, but it's not because we have more than our fair share of of violent criminals. You mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. Um, the, you have to look elsewhere to figure out what's going wrong. Mm-hmm. Right? And you have to sit there and say, where are the breakdowns of what's happening? Where are the breakdowns of how are these things missed? How are these? I remember reading um, the woman who uh, son uh, shot the school at Columbine, reading her book a couple of years ago. And she's talking about the things she missed. And she's talking about him saying goodbye, mom, that morning. And she's talking about how did she not go in his room and see this arsenal that was going on and what she takes away for the rest of her life. And what you're realizing is in the family that we're reading about, Everybody is shattered in many different ways. Even the brothers, though they don't want to see themselves as shattered. They are because they are pariahs in some ways because their sister stepped outside the system. She did something different, you know? Yeah. 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 So there is one Epicurean moment. You made me want to roast corn and serve it with lime. And I think I'm going to the farmer's stand that they told me last weekend was the last weekend. I'm hoping there's an ear of corn that I can do that with. Because it sounds fantastic. You roast it's with, fantastic. Husk, with the husk on, you roast the, roast the corn. Um, at home, I do it without the husk on. I think okay. there they do it with the husk on, but it's too difficult. So I just pull the husk out and then put it on the grill. And then, yeah, it's it's a great concoction. Yeah, I've got to go try that. The culinary, the culinary skill I will bring from this book groups, this is what you should be serving. The corn that is roasted with the lime on top. So just keep this in mind, you know? Um, I'm thinking about this book with all that's going on in Iran right now. And once again, women are being persecuted for not following the rules. And we are so ardently upset about what is going on there. And we are watching this and seeing what's going on and young women standing up for what's going, what they believe in. People stood up for what they believed in with George Floyd a couple of years ago, but they were not 
killed. They were not, you know, maimed by what was going on. They were not taken to prison in quite the same way these women are just being taken for a headscarf not being worn correctly. Did, are you? I was giving it so much thought when I was thinking about honor because it's the same thing of women being put down, women being put in a place. No, I think I think that's true for almost every society. I mean, um, uh, the foundation of patriarchy is is you know the willingness to control women, whether it's their actual movements or their sexuality, their very bodies. Right? I mean that. That is how um, any patriarchal society sort of asserts its power and its influence, and it and women always seem to bear the brunt of this. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, so, yes, I mean there are differences in degrees, and we would be foolish not to acknowledge the differences in degrees, of course. Um, but let us not kid ourselves. I mean, you know, I I don't feel safe leaving my lovely home and going for a walk at 2 a.m. Mm -hmm. I don't. Mm -hmm. And until I do, I will not consider the society that I live in to be enlightened or mm -hmm. to be uh, safe. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, uh, the day I can do that, um, I will consider the world that I live in uh, to have evolved uh, to where I would like to see it. You know, so, so you know, Western women, we have, I mean, we have our own um, blind spots, if you will, mm -hmm. and you know, it's it's easy to read a look a book like Honor and and see what another society's blind spots are. Um, but my deepest hope would be that you know American readers see some of themselves in the stories of these two women. Mm -hmm. And you think about that walk at two a.m. Something that simple. To go out for a walk at 2 a.m. and feel safe. And right mm -hmm. now, I mean, I we moved our office out of New of, the, of New York City, but to, to hear the violence, the crime rate of what's going on, it, your your head is just like I know that subway stop, I know that place of what's going on, I know people who have had things happen to them, and that's something that you thought about in the 70s, but you didn't think about now. And how did we go back 50 years? How mm -hmm. how how did we take this really dark turn the other way? Is it money? Is it is it um, higher levels of mental instability? What is happening and going on? But it's I agree with you. I think that we've we've gone backwards. We haven't gone forwards. We've gone backwards. We've taken some steps, and we need to sit there and look at what we're doing at this point. Right. So, so it sounds like when you write this book, you know where it's going when you start it, and you let the story evolve, including holding some things back. Am I right? Do you have notes? Do you have an outline, or is it just up here? The latter. It's all up here. I, I, I'm just too lazy to to sit down and you know outline on a chalkboard or on paper. Um, and and the fact is that things change and things evolve. So how many outlines am I going to keep doing? Mm -hmm. It's it's easier to just keep thinking about it. You know, it's just that's all it is. That's what writing is. It's mm -hmm. it's not just the act of typing. It's just when you're not at the computer. That's when you're actually writing because you're just thinking about your characters. And if you know your characters well enough, you can kind of predict what they will do next. And what they do next becomes the spine of the story. That's right. So when you're sitting down, do you have a moment where you stop every day? Do you say you write for a couple of hours? Because you know where it's going. Like I would be really excited right. about getting to those parts where, you know, Mina's writing at this point. Do you say, I mean, write for a specific amount of time? What's what's your structure on that? I'm just not disciplined enough to do anything of the sort. I basically write until one, I have other things to do, like great papers for my day job. Right. Um or my hand hurts so much that it's like I, I physically cannot do it anymore. And those are the most wonderful and joyous days. I mean, I was I was joking with a friend of mine the other day uh, saying if they could come up with a technique where they could put like a, a, you know, a probe or something in my brain, I could write my next book in one day. Like if I could just dump it out because I know it, it's all there. But the physical act of typing is, you know, there are just human limitations on how much of that you can do 
every given day, which is why it takes as long as it does. But in terms of actually knowing it and knowing the lines and knowing the dialogue and yeah, I could, if I could just dump it on the computer, I could do it in one day. Wow. That's what it I think well, you just get a microphone and you just like, you know, just say, and then say someone, please type these words. <laughs> yeah. But even that, you know, that, that takes time oh, to do. Yes. This is like, just, I want something like, like a vacuum cleaner that just sucks it out. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just now see. Being, I mean, really, well, all these inventions we've come up with through the years, right. so maybe the AirPod could do that next, you know, exactly. you just shout exactly. out. Maybe not? that's, yeah. Yeah. maybe that's what the Apple guys do, you know? <laughs> So what's the editing process like with you and your editor? So you have got the story that's come out of your brain. You've got this all there. Then she takes, she, he takes a look at it. And then from there changes, or is it pretty clean when you go in? Yeah, no, in the case of honor, definitely changes. Um, mm. um, she, she had some very, I had a terrific editor uh, for this book and we worked pretty closely on it together. She, she wanted some changes, I believe, in the first third of it. Um, I made those changes. Um, then I think we both decided, nah, didn't quite work the way mm -hmm. she had hoped it would. So we kind of went back. Um, but in the going back, there was a lot of tightening um, that I did. I I had the love story, uh, spoilers here, I guess, between Smita and Mohan much earlier on mm -hmm. and um she didn't like that and she kept saying hold it hold it hold it you know wait 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 on this uh and that was a huge uh suggestion from her which the minute she said it it clicked mm -hmm. um you know you always know uh when something is not quite working in a novel but sometimes because you put in all the work and the effort you're just reluctant to uh, jettison it and abandon it you know so you almost wait for permission from somebody who's reading it for the first time mm -hmm. to in a sense confirm what you already know but you're just too lazy to do it of your own accord you know mm -hmm. and the instant she started saying I don't think the love story works you know um, this this soon in the narrative I was like, oh my God, she's right, you know. So, mm -hmm. so I had to do a fairly major rewrite because of that, and um, I think she was right on the money. You know? I think she was too because it builds the tension. You're building the, the tension between them throughout yes. the book, and yes. you have a thought of where it could go, but it may not. You're not really sure okay. what's going to happen, right. exactly. and they're and they're very tentative around each other. So it's that push pull mm -hmm. kind of a thing as well. Yes. So yeah, and she's really grappling with going back, like any, anything to be a connection with going back. And you're seeing that because she can be dismissive at times of like, no, this is like the way it is. And I'm not like that anymore. Right. And then when she spills her story, you understand more about why right. she felt she did. There's so much to be talked about in this book. Do you talk to book groups? Do you spend time talking to book groups? Is your schedule stuff? You really don't have time. Yeah, I'm I'm sort of winding down for this year. Um, you know, just saying no to invitations. But yeah, I do. I I enjoy it. I you know I I pop in mostly on Zoom. Um, mm -hmm. uh, this year anyway, mostly on Zoom. And, and yeah, I enjoy it. Uh, hearing questions directly from readers and knowing, you know, what they got out of the book. So it's, it's fun for me. It's satisfying for me to do those. But uh, at this point, I'm just, I can't do any more this year. Yeah, the time. Well, you know what you can do at this point? I'm, I'm just thinking is because I know for this interview, because you've been out for a while, there are a number of really good interviews with you that are out there. And if you put those together on your website and say to people, I'm not available, but if you listen to these pieces You'll right. have a much, you you can have a much richer understanding because there are topics that I talk about there, my pacing or whatever, and be able to give those things up. So, I mean, That's it's just a, a thought. Idea. Yeah. It's just a thought because I know I listened to some that were just really good. And you, and especially when I'm talking about a book that's been out a while, I want to make sure I didn't miss something or miscast something that I know an, um, an author has already spoken about or be right. able to explore it more with them or whatever. So I'm just suggesting that to people because it's, it is a big time commitment to sit and talk right. to groups. But if you can come up right. with 
watch this and I think you'll get a much better idea. It may be, I love that. That's a great idea. Thank you for that. Yeah. Because there, there's so many, you know, there's so much many resources because of Zoom. Okay, well, let's just go back for a second. If you toured, you had to go to like 10 cities, you go to 10 pretty big places. You're not going to go to small towns. And you wouldn't have the opportunity to talk to as many people as what Zoom has allowed you to do with interviews it's true. to share with the masses. And what we are doing this book reporter talks to series, when people discover the paperback, like now, it's not a new book. It's not something they heard about when Reese picked this back in January. Right. And now you're also um, able to sit there and find it in five years or when you're 10 years from now where you're really finding this love for this book you can hear what the author said, as opposed to you weren't available the one night that they were going to be in New York. It's a very good point. Yeah, very I good just, point. I just love that. So yeah. did you have the title right away? Because it feels like Honor was the perfect title. Was this right there from the start? Yeah, I did. I did. And that's rare for me because uh, very often, um, well, it, I don't know if it's rare. It's about 50-50. There have been times when I've been asked to change the space between us. Uh, that was not the working title mm -hmm. that came really at the last minute you know mm -hmm. at the last minute the editor did a search realized that there were tons of books out with the former title uh, wrote to me and said you know book is being shipped off to the printer in a couple of days I need you to come up with a new title now mm -hmm. you know wow so I sent her a list of 12 titles that night I remember staying up to like 2 a.m pulling out all the poetry books, you know, from my shelves, trying to find the perfect phrase. Couldn't come up, came up with 12. And then I thought, I'll make it a baker's dozen. And I came up with the space between us as the wow. third choice and sent it off to her. And she wrote back a couple of days later and said, we love it. That's a great title. And I thought, really? wow, that's number 13 on my, that's the last one on my list. That's a great title. And, uh, you know, she was right. Yeah. So when in doubt, trust editors. I can see the space. I can see exactly what's going on. It's so interesting. So, so yeah. interesting. Um, the cover is terrific. I really love the cover. Um, I feel like there's a messaging here on the cover. There's so much to say on the cover. Was this the first try? And was this something you were, I'm trying to hold straight. <laughs> Yeah. Was this no, something, you, so was this a first one or was this a number of tries? No, this was, they nailed it. Algonquin uh, nailed it. This was their very first cover that they shared with me. And um, it absolutely works. My editor explained that the choice of mangoes, of course, is from the scene where Abdul, who's doing this very, very kind of tentative and uh, timid courtship of Mina, you know, presents her with these two mangoes. Um, and um, yeah, and, and so that's why they picked, picked it. So I think it's a very intelligently and beautifully designed uh, jacket. Mm -hmm. And for book clubs, mangoes easier than grilled, grilled corn. Just saying <laughs> that, just throwing that out there, folks. <laughs> Mango salsa, we can go in a lot of directions. <laughs> How about the audio? Um, I say Snitha um, Mathan is the narrator. Did you have a hand in picking Sneha. her? I'm sorry. It's what, it's Sneha. Sneha? Okay. Sneha, yeah. Sneha. Yeah. Sneha. I'll go um, record that. Sneha. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, well, yes. I mean, they gave me a choice of a few. Uh, she has read some of my books in the past, and I've always thought that she's done a beautiful job. So when I saw her name on the list, and initially they were going to have two people, you know, two okay. voice actors, mm -hmm. one for Smita's sections, one for Mina's sections. And after they did an audition with Sneha, um, because I strongly urged them to, to you know, look in her direction, um, they found that she did both the voices of both the characters so well mm -hmm. that um, they just picked her. That's so great. I was very pleased when she said yes. Well, thank you for the pronunciation because I have this thing with audiobook uh, narrators. They need a page with all their names on it and how they pronounce them because there's so many that we will have no idea how to pronounce that's these names. And everybody says, well, it's at the beginning of the audio, but I'm not listening to the audio. And if exactly. you want to include this, and I just, I actually went, there's an audio book group. They're putting together a number of the performers together. And I said to them, I am telling you, this would be the most beneficial thing for me to have. 
It's because true. if not, I have no clue what's going on. Right. You know, I, you know, I make up. Yeah. So, and you, sometimes yeah. you call and they give it to you phonetically and you still can't figure it out. So good to know. So are you thinking about or working on another novel at this point and when we might see it? Um, that's an easy one to answer. You might see it as early as next fall, 2023. Fantastic. It's a, it's a novel called The Museum of Failures. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, Algonquin is going to publish it next year. Fantastic. Fantastic. Something definitely for readers to look forward to. Thank you so much for your time. This has been such, such, such a pleasure. Thank and, you. I've really enjoyed myself. Yeah, I've, I've, I tried. I know today I was going through and I have a number of folded down pages. I do that terrible thing where I fold down <laughs> yes. and I always fold down and I don't write down. I don't underline. I just fold down because I want to go back later and say, why did that matter? And does it why? still matter yeah. for an interview? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a good, that's, that's great. I understand the logic of that. So, 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 so. Thank you, Carol. This was really, I really enjoyed myself. Thank you for making this fun. And I look so. forward to next time. Next time I'm going to be much earlier in the game. I hope so. <laughs> All right. And for our listeners, look forward to seeing you next time on Book Reporter Talks To. Remember, you can subscribe on YouTube and never miss an episode or find our podcast wherever you will find Book Reporter Talks To, wherever podcast you want to find. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank Take you. care.